thank you. I mean, that was a um, way kinder introduction that I think I deserve, but um, right. So first of all, I would like to thank CAPAS and especially the directors for bringing together in such a unique way so many interesting scholars and giving me the opportunity to be part of that. So today I'm going to talk about the research that I'm carrying out here, um, but that is taking the form of what I hope will be a monograph. So I divided the talk in five parts. Um, in the first part, I'm going to introduce the subject, and I'm going to explain here also the changes and the challenges, sorry, and motivations for carrying out the research. And with this, I hope to set the scene to introduce the historical sources that I'm working with. Um, then I will have a look at the theoretical framework that I'm hoping to use to approach these sources. I will talk about the methods that we have developed, and then I will talk a bit more about what is next to finally offer some concluding uh, thoughts. So I would like to start with a very simple but relevant set of questions. How can we understand the beginning or the end of a world? How does a community, a civilization, goes through a devastating event and interprets what happened and hopes or despairs at what is coming? How do political organizations, social groups, families and individuals find meaning or create new beginnings from an end? And what happens when the clash between two completely different worlds means the end, but also new beginnings for both transforming ideas, perceptions, modes of living, and most importantly, lives? On the 8th of November of 1519, Hernando Cortés, a, ca a Spanish captain and his crew, entered Tenochtitlan accompanied by numerous indigenous allies. Tenochtitlan was among the most extraordinary cities that the Americas had seen and the capital of the Mexica, the Aztec Empire. The Mexica were the most powerful civilization in Mesoamerica, dominating a significant part of it. At their arrival, what the Spanish saw was a striking city with around 200,000 people, larger than any European city at the time. Founded on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco, Tenochtitlan had floating gardens, massive carriageways crossing the lake, aqueducts, palaces, public schools, markets with products brought from as far as modern Nicaragua, and even a zoo. The Spanish describe it as the Venice of the New World. The encounter between these two civilizations will change and shape the world's dynamics in the centuries to come and bring the end of the Mesoamerican world as millions of indigenous people knew it. Only two years after the arrival to central Mexico in 1521, the great city of Tenochtitlan will fall, be burned, and destroyed by the Spanish and the thousands of indigenous allies that accompany them. In helping the newcomers defeat their Mexica oppressors, the indigenous allies little knew of the fate of their societies and cultures in the years to come. And from the ruins of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Spanish Empire in America, uh, would emerge as the viceroyalty of New Spain. Now, the so-called conquest of America is an extraordinary event and period in history. The encounter of two worlds will give birth to new social understandings, cultural alliances, and the profound restructuration of all Mesoamerican and world systems. It will be historically described and lamented by the indigenous communities that live it as the end of the world. Now, the catastrophe that was suffered by the Mesoamerican communities during the 16th century has only few parallels in uh, world history. Twelve previously unknown diseases were introduced to America during this period, and in the first century after their European arrival saw at least 15 epidemics that devastated central Mexico. Now, researchers have calculated that mortality was as high as 90% and at least 70% by the most conservative studies. Indigenous people in Mesoamerica were, of course, no strangers to disease and illness. Um, and the different groups across this region developed not only detailed knowledge about illnesses that affected the body, but they also created holistic, medical, therapeutical, and ritual systems that included the treatment of ailments and unbalances of the different anemic forces that inhabit the body. 
Of course, Mesoamerican ideas about the human body and illnesses were conceptually different to those that the European have, and I won't have time to go into this today. But the same as in Europe, diseases and illnesses were treated according to their etiology and beyond their physical manifestation. And Mesoamerican medicine include also practical methods. So the Nahua, for instance, had extensive knowledge about the therapeutic use of plants, and their medics developed advanced approaches in comparison with their European counterparts at the time in areas such as battlefield medicine, where they clean uh, wounds regularly and establish chiropractic techniques, perform dentistry, and chirurgical procedures also successfully. Despite this, however, the introduction of previously unseen disease to America, for which the population had no natural immunity, would certainly prove devastating. Multiple studies have calculated that the population of central Mexico at the arrival of the Spanish was between 15 and 20 million. By the 1600s, only 2 million have survived. These numbers, of course, have been questioned. There are plenty of difficulties, um, in fact, and issues with population modeling of past societies, as archaeologists here in the room will probably know. And of course, there is no doubt that war and the new political arrangements and settlements in position provoke displacements and famine. But Historical data evaluations and recent paleopathology and archaeological studies increasingly confirm that the epidemics were among the main factors um, of population decline in, in the first uh, century of the colony. And this suggests that more than two thirds of deaths in this century were due uh, to uh, epidemics. Now, the devastation provoked by introduced diseases such as smallpox, new types of influenza, chickenpox, measles, um, typhus, mumps, and other which etiology have proved quite difficult to identify will later also be recorded um, uh, by multiple Spanish and indigenous sources. So the first record that we have in America of smallpox was from its arrival in December of 1518 to Santo Domingo, um, where Fray Luis de Figueroa and Fray Alonso de Santo Domingo reported that a third of the indigenous population have died from it. And by the time that Cortes arrives to America, the Spanish had already established the, party, the, um, uh, sorry, the practice of raiding the adjacent islands to the Española, so today's uh, Dominican Republic for slaves, as the population there has been already decimated. So the disease would rapidly spread to Jamaica, Cuba, and Guatemala, reaching Mexico in 1520, with the expedition of Pamphilo de Narvaez that had as purpose to arrest Hernán Cortés. And the reason for this was that Cortés did not have permission to conquest or to settle in the lands of what is Mexico today. The expedition of 1519 that would lead Cortés to Tenochtitlan had in fact been justified by the lack of labor supply in the Caribbean due to the epidemics. So Cortés was never supposed to settle in land, but to look for resources to replenish labor. So the governor of Cuba sends uh, Narváez to arrest him. The first existing record about the disease in the coast of Mexico is dated on the 30th of August of 1520. It was written by the judge Lucas Vázquez de Ailón in the report to Carlos V, describing the voyage with the Narvaez fleet that arrived to Cozumel and then departed to Veracruz. So this is the coast of uh, Mexico. In this report, Vázquez de Ailón complains about the transportation of up to 1,000 indigenous people um, uh, describing, well, this was against his advice, describing how in Fernandina, this is to say in Cuba, there was already a crisis and a lack of indigenous population due to the smallpox epidemic. So after defeating Pamphilo de Narvaez in May 1520, Hernando Cortés would return to Tenochtitlan with part of the crew coming from Cuba. And between May and September of 1520, smallpox had spread from the coast to the province of, Tla of uh, Tepeaca and Tlaxcala in the center of Mexico. In the meantime, while the disease was already spreading, Moctezuma, the Mexica Tlacuani, or Tlatuani or king, had been killed. And his brother, Cuitlahuatzin, led the resistance that resulted in the defeat of the Spanish and their Tlaxcaltecan allies in the episode that is uh, popularly known as the Sad Night or the Noche Triste in June of 1520. Um, sadly, the new, the new Tlatuani will not live long, and the Xupahuali de Tenochtitlan, the Codex of uh, 
1576, records his death from smallpox. And in the codex, um, the body of the Tlatuani can be observed as a bulto mortuorio. This is to say, as a mortuary bundle in the Mesoamerican tradition. And this is depicted with red uh, postals around. Uh, so this is the representation of a smallpox here. By December of 1520, smallpox had also reached the rest of the valley. And uh, this is recorded by indigenous documents, including pictorial accounts and Spanish sources. So the Tecamachalco annals give an explicit account of the gruesome picture. So this is describing what is called two flint knife, so the year of 1520. At that time, what everyone called the Teosahuatl, the great pox, the divine scorch, was terrorizing people. Large pox form completely disfiguring people's faces. Because of it, there was great mortality. It will begin with blood, what is called the tlageli, this is to say dysentery. It has never occurred in former times, then began all the sickness that had been breaking out. While the contagion started to accelerate, the increasing the increasingly imminent devastation of the communities would be also accompanied by the uncertainty from the unstability provoked by sudden voids in the established power structures. So indigenous sources especially mention the death of the indigenous elite um, and members of the governing class featuring the epidemics as the main or among the main uh, events in the annals and codices. And of course, the Codex, uh, uh, the codice Florentino that was written by Fray Bernardino de Sagún and other indigenous authors described quite vividly um, the arrival of a smallpox to Tenochtitlan. And I'm not giving you here the full picture of it, right? Um, but as you can see, we know quite a lot about this episode, um, but also of other major epidemics. Now, there have been plenty of studies um, about disease during the colonial period in central Mexico, and I can point you to multiple collections written from the 1940s looking into this topic, and many other wonderful research across the whole of the Americas delving into it. So why is it important to come back to this specific topic, right? Well, in my view, despite the, um, of the advance in our knowledge about it, I believe that there are many challenges that we have still to overcome um, in the research of the history of the epidemics in America. A profound literature review reveals that most of the studies concentrate mainly on three events pointed out as the most widespread and severe outbreaks. So this is the smallpox, the smallpox epidemic of 1520 that you just heard a bit about, and the epidemics of 1545 and 1576, which is speculated could have been typhus. And although research has changed in the last two decades, the majority of studies focus on the most traditional sources and the centers of political power. And the problem with this, however, is that, um, as I was saying before, we have identified at least 15 different epidemics that happened during this century. And as such, there is much more, more um, way more to learn about this uh, beyond these three outbreaks. And although to a certain extent it might be surprising that the scholarship has mainly focused on these three events, this is related to the fact that studying health and disease in the colonial era poses multiple problems. And um, I think there are at least three major challenges in the study of epidemics for this period. So, on one hand, these three epidemics appear in the best known historical sources, particularly the chronicles of the conquest and mainly uh, the accounts by the Spanish. But the problem with this, in the words of Camilla Townsend, is that for generations, those who have wanted to know about the lives of ancient Native Americans have studied the objects uncovered in archaeological digs, and they have read the words of Europeans who began to write about Indians almost as soon as they met them. From these sources, more than any others, scholars have drawn their conclusions and deemed them justified. But it was a dangerous endeavor that inevitably led to distortions. To make a comparison, it would have never been considered acceptable to claim to understand medieval France with access to only a few dozen archaeological digs and a hundred texts in English with nothing written in French or Latin. Yet different standards have been applied to Indians. The picture of the Aztecs that has emerged is blood curling. The flint knives with their embedded eyes, the sacrificial stones, the skull racks, all leave indelible Im images in the imagination. 
We moderns look at them and then invent this accompanying scene, the spoken words, the music, and the context. We envision orgies of violence like the one depicted in the film Apocalypto. Textbooks present the same images and teach young people that the noble uh, native peoples were waiting to be released from this regime of such cruelty. The books written by 16th century Spaniards likewise encourage readers to believe that the people from um, whom the conquistadores defeated were barbaric in the extreme, that God willed the end of their civilization as it encapsulated all that was wrong with human nature. Even those written by more sympathetic observers, those Spaniards who live in indigenous communities and learn the language are filled with condescension towards the people they never quite came to understand, interpreting events through a European set of expectations and thus seeing the choices the Indians made as bizarre at best. The Aztec would have never recognized themselves in the picture of the world that exists in the books and movies we have made. They thought of themselves as humble people. Oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, right. So they, they thought of themselves as humble people who had made the best of a bad situation and who had shown bravery and thus reaped its rewards. I apologize for the very long quote, but I think Camilla Townsend has perfectly encapsulated the ways in which much research has been carried out in America. And I also um, need to say that in places like Mexico, we have a very long tradition under the colonial approaches that the English speaking world is just starting to catch up with. Historians like Miguel Leon Portilla, Alfredo Lopez Austin, and Mercedes uh, de la Garza, among many others, started working since the 1950s addressing precisely this massive bias that Camila Townsend uh, uh, refers to. And I have to say that newer generations of Mexican historians and archaeologists as well are making great progress in this regard. But still, at least concerning the history of disease and epidemics in central Mexico, studies seem to concentrate on major events and on the best um, known historical sources. Now, Another important issue lies in the correct identification of diseases. So this is to say that people at the time were encountering diseases that they haven't seen before. So how does a linguistic term referring to a disease that is unknown emerges, becomes common, and how it is then widely spread over time and recorded in historical sources? So this is a question, for instance, that we need to address. On the other hand, the Nahuatl term cocolistli that is found on historical sources and which has been usually interpreted as smallpox in reality and contrary to popular belief um, actually applied to many multiple diseases. And not only that, as, as uh, Christina Wariner has pointed out, it is also quite difficult to identify a particular disease from the historical description of symptoms. So this is to say that the descriptions given might be applicable to many possible uh, diseases among which we can mention typhus, uh, hemorrhagic fever, pneumonic plague, among many others. And finally, we need to consider that until recently that digitization has become more widespread, it has been particularly difficult to bring together thousands of pieces of evidence related to the epidemics, which are often scattered in disparate sources, including extensive historical collections and dispersing documents across many international archives, like the Archivo General de Indias, the National Library of France, the British Library, the Archivo General de la Nación um, in Mexico and Colombia and so on, right? And of course, we have to take into account that gathering and analyzing information in a traditional way tends to be the work of a lifetime. So understandably, there has never been a systematic analysis of 16th century ethnohistorical records at a large scale, aiming to analyze the different ways in which this, these epidemics were spoken about, including linguistic terms and variations applied to diseases during the epidemics, and to answer how these experiences differed across the visa royalty. And there has never been a project attempting to bring together the information about the multiple epidemics in the 16th century beyond these well-known episodes, especially aiming to map the landscape of diseases and how more peripheral geographies beyond the centers of political power were affected. Now, 
this is where digital methods and computational approaches can become highly relevant, right? So we recently finished a project called Digging into Early Colonial Mexico, which resulted in, um, among many other things, the creation of, um, of um, um, uh, the first Mexico and Guatemala uh, 16th century digital gazetteer. And we also created a fully annotated collection for the geographic reports of New Spain, uh, which is one of the most important sources for the study of colonial America. Now, this historical source has thousands of pages that contain vital information regarding the multiple epidemics that uh, Mesoamerican societies suffer uh, during this century. And they also record to a certain extent how they uh, were perceived and how, how were they confronted. But before I explain more about this project and the methods that we actually use with it, let me just introduce first the historical sources that we are working with and explain also the theoretical framework um, I'm using for this specific uh, project and research. So, the geographic reports of New Spain, or Relaciones Geográficas de Nueva España, um, constitutes, I will say without doubt, one of the main sources of information for the colonial period in what is uh, today uh, Mexico and Guatemala. So the corpus is basically a massive compilation of information that was gathered between 1577 and 1585 and is the product of a questionnaire that was ordered by Philip II, uh, the King of Spain at the time. And the main purpose of the questionnaire was to collect all sorts of information about the colonies um, of the Spanish crown, including, of course, the viceroyalty of New Spain. Now, the story behind the compilation of this historical source is actually quite fascinating, but I will say that the great importance of this corpus is that it contains thousands of pages of information about the situation both of the indigenous and the Spanish communities at the time. And the questionnaire um, uh, from which uh, this information is compiled was elaborated by the then chronicler cosmographer of the Indies, Juan Lopez de Velasco, and the final version of this questionnaire contained 50 questions in total. So the type of, the, of information that it collects is really important because the corregidores and the alcaldes, both the Spanish and indigenous, typically assemble for each town um, a group that generally um, or usually included indigenous elders and nobles who provided quite detailed information about the local uh, scene. And of course, the amount of detail varies between places, so not all recordings were obviously the same, but the source certainly captures a great deal of data that speaks about people, traditions, religion, government, military organization, language, of course, and, uh, and there is also information, as you can see in the slide, about climate, geography, uh, types of trade that happen in the region, uh, previous relationships between neighbors, uh, information about plants, diseases, how to cure these diseases, you name it. This is quite an, an astonishing resource. And in addition to this, there was also a request to accompany these questioners with as much information as possible on the geographies, on the place names, actually in Spanish, but also in the local languages with further explanations about what these place names meant, um, details on local geography, and so on. And this resulted in the creation of the wonderful pinturas of this collection that I'll tell you more a bit um, about them in, in, in a bit. Right. Now, just to give you an idea of the linguistic and the geographic extent of this information, the whole corpus has around 2.8 million words, so this is not big data in modern terms, but it's certainly historical big data, and it covers the regions uh, that you see in this map. So it gathers information from 50 provinces, 168 main jurisdictions, more than 200 subordinate jurisdictions, more than 400 uh, major towns, and more than 2,000 small towns and villages. Now, what I want to do, back, to do now is to go back a bit and reflect about the context in which these documents are created. And in doing so, I want to establish the theoretical framework I'm using to approach the research questions, but also the sources, right? So one has to remember that indigenous societies were encountering a completely different idea of the world. And the contact with the Spanish was certainly lived and experienced as a rupture, despite that only a few generations after, there is some sense of continuation, right? So the Chilambalam de Chumayel records the next passage. 
There was then no sickness, they had no aching bones, they had then no high fever, they had then no smallpox, they had then no burning chest, they had then no abdominal pain, they had then no consumption, they had then no headache. At that time, the course of humanity was orderly. The foreigners made it otherwise when they arrived here. So the Chilamba Lam de Chumayel, um, we have to think that um, Mesoamerican people um, were no, as I was saying before, strangers to disease, right? So we have examples like uh, the Codex Tejeriano Remensi that talks about a catarro pestilencial. This is um, a, a flu epidemic that happens in 1454 that brings death to many uh, uh, Nahua people in central Mexico. So of course they have recorded epidemics, but what we see in the Chilambalam, the Chumayel, is actually a lament that goes beyond the simple recording of illness. It refers to the experience, the longing and the loss of an almost mythical time when things used to be better and there was order in the world. And there is no doubt in here who is the responsible for the end of this world. So in colonial documents, particularly those documenting histories, we often encounter the reflections of a rupture in time, in experience, in tradition, in life, and where actors have no other choice but to engage with the new reality and contest, revel, transform, create another, or comply with this new reality, right? So, how can we delve into the stories of uh, the people that lived 500 years ago and whose lives, cultures, and perspectives got entangled with a vision of the world that was not theirs? So to consider these things, um, I believe it is very useful to return to the concept of cosmovision, which Alfredo Lopez Austin once proposed as a compelling framework for understanding the pre-Hispanic um, worldview. So the concept of cosmovision uh, refers to and encompasses central shared concepts, ideas, and understandings of what, how, and why the world it is a certain way, which allows societies to act as a cultural unit. And Lopez Austin tells us that cosmovision is in many ways like grammar, that is the work of everyone and no one, the product of reason, but not of conscience. And as such, cosmovision guides the way we behave in society and nature, permeating individuals, but also the various sociocultural systems and institutions we create. And even our technological solutions and our material culture can be considered expressions of our own cosmovision. And in this sense, the Relaciones Geográficas are conceived as a technological instrument of empire, whose objective was to gather and to organize certain types of information about the visa royalty. And the questionnaire acted as an instrument that allowed the historical, social, political, and material comparison of the geographies, well, obviously according uh, to the vision of the Spanish, aspiring to compile um, what their cosmovision considered useful, particularly from the point of view of the Spanish crown and its interest. But we also have to think that this compilation of information from thousands of towns and villages is done through the lens of the Spanish, but also through the indigenous corregidores, alcaldes, and, and, and communities, as we said before, with the help of interpreters, elders, educated or knowledgeable indigenous people, and sometimes also indigenous scholars. And although they are, uh, the, the Relaciones have uh, traditionally been considered a Spanish source, or at least one with a strong European um, influence, it can also be said that uh, given the historical context, these documents reflect multiple belief systems, interests, and ways of relating to the knowledge that they portrayed. And in this sense, I think we can approach these documents as a polyphony. Now, this is an idea that I know that is not uh, new by any means. Um, I was introduced uh, to it uh, a while ago in my wanderings uh, with my wonderful colleagues in the realm of literature. Um, and I have my doubts about it. So I want to discuss this tomorrow in our uh, recap session as well, because I wonder how much actually this concept might give or might have the capacity to address the problems of power and balance in the creation of these materials, but also to help me think about uh, the explicit dialogues uh, from a position of subalternity, right? 
right? Or even sometimes hidden contestations to the colonial matrix of power. But I find it quite fascinating, and it seems to me that we can use it to approach the way in which the geographic reports are created. So um, Mikhail Batkin introduces the idea of polyphony as a, a feature of narrative, as I understand it. And the idea comes from music, where it is understood that a song will be created from many different independent lines of melody, right? So under this idea, he says that in novels, we can identify multiple voices and that these are not subordinated to the primary voice of the author. He says that, in fact, truth is not born, nor is it to be found inside the head of an individual person. It is born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of their dialogic interaction. And so for him, life also works in this way. So our perspectives and material culture and manifestations do not exist in a void. They are integrated in a network where there is dialogue and relationships that exist in a temporal and spatial context. And so in this sense, we can say that the Relaciones Geográficas are a polyphony that brings together the cosmovision of indigenous and European uh, worlds. And this can be clearly seen in the marvelous spatial representations or maps attached uh, to many of these accounts. So when Juan Lopez de Velasco, the chronicler cosmographer that creates the questioner, asks to include the paintings of the territories that are described in the texts, he probably expected to receive maps um, in the European cartographic sense, right? And yet many of these paintings that were uh, collected as part of the answers to the questioner clearly showed the Mesoamerican spatial tradition and cosmovision now intertwined with that of the Spanish conception of the world. So just to give you uh, quickly an idea of this, we can see in here already the representation of the Christian churches, of course, and then uh, we have that combined with the spatial but also um, political representations of um, the indigenous governors of Atengo, Miskiawala, and Amoltepe. Um, the forms of also representation of water in Mesoamerican um, conceptions, but also place names, uh, this is to say toponyms and locations too. And we even in Amoltepec have this wonderful representation of a genealogy followed by what is um, called the Altepetl. So this is a representation of uh, the territorial uh, form of organization in Mesoamerica that is represented by a hill, a mountain uh, filled with water. Um, and I will say that like the pinturas, the textual descriptions in the Relaciones often contain the interweaving of these two cosmovisions that contribute to the creation of this new corpus, but also an attempt to explain uh, this new world. So in this way, I'm approaching the Relaciones, right? But this also has to do with the ways in which we are developing new technologies and methods to study these very large collections of documents. And as you can see, historical sources like the Relaciones Geográficas can be thought as historical big data. This is to say that we are dealing with, uh, in this particular case, 12 volumes of thousands of pages, talking also about thousands of places, right? And um, as we were saying at the beginning, the compilation of information in history, particularly at a large scale and um, across large territories, can be very challenging. So, as Amin uh, mentioned, a good part of my research has focused on the development of computational uh, technologies that allows the semi and the automated identification and analysis of information from historical documents. And this includes the combination of methods and techniques that come from the fields of artificial intelligence. And I in here prefer the term uh, machine learning for a bunch of reasons that I think we have already explored. Um, but um, okay, the field is called AI, so anyway. And and as part of this research, we have created data sets, but also methods and software um, especially dedicated to this. So one of the challenges in looking at historical sources, right, is the precise identification of places, particularly because um, of the territorial dynamics of the colonial period. Many places uh, disappear, change name, uh, they actually move, new are created and so on. So the first task that we decided to tackle in the project was to create an historical gazetteer with all the places that are mentioned in the geographic reports of New Spain. 
Now, this endeavor resulted in the identification of more than 14,000 place names, and this is more easily, I would say, said than done, um, but we actually managed to do it, and now we have the first 16th century digital uh, gazetteer of New Spain. And we also developed more than 70 different layers of geographic information, such as ecclesiastic jurisdictions, civil jurisdictions, among many others. So this required um, uh, four years of extensive research and design. Um, but I think it was completely worth it, because uh, from this geographic data set, we can now connect historical information associated to these places. Now, once you have that, Something that we imagine and that we have been developing for a while was the capacity to take, let's say, um, a collection of these hundreds or thousands of historical documents like the Relaciones and search information from this in such a way that uh, could analyze not only similar pieces of information across many different collections, but also those that are associated to particular geographies. And in order to do that, our research group um, at Lancaster created a method called uh, geographical text analysis. And the Digging into Early Colonial Mexico project has created a software that allows the identification and mining of information at a large scale from historical documents while identifying possible connections to the geographic information related to it. And this method and the software we created allows you to ask questions like, um, what are the places mentioned in this collection? But most importantly, how you can actually ask um, what is being said, for instance, about a particular topic of your interest and whether this is connected uh, to a specific geography. So just to give you an idea of what this does, we employ um, a combination of machine learning techniques, including natural language processing, as I was saying before, corpus linguistics methods, and also geographic information science techniques. Now, for those of you that have never heard about natural language processing, this is a subdiscipline for computer science and artificial intelligence that aims to, uh, in a simple way, teach the computer how human language behaves in written or in spoken corpora. And what we have basically developed, and this is related and expands geographical text analysis, is a big data approach that allows the computer to identify, cross-link, and analyze information in corpora like this one that otherwise will take you a lifetime to explore. So just for you to understand how this works under the hood, um, um, with natural language processing, what we are doing is to employ machine learning uh, to teach the computers how to identify keywords and concepts that are of our interest in very large historical collections. So the project, uh, during the project, we created an ontology where we defined the categories that we wanted uh, the machine to learn to identify, and then uh, these are the ones that you see on the left of the screen. And we generated a sample that is first annotated and verified by people, and once we have this sample, the algorithm in the computer learns from it, and from that we can give the machine thousands of documents that it hasn't seen before, and it will generate the annotations automatically for you. Right now, the example that you have on the screen is showing you um, how we annotated the documents that belongs to the Relaciones, telling the computer what each annotation um, uh, is assigning categories to it, so you can see plants, architecture, information on religion, uh, cultural artifacts, and so on. Now, with this, then you can start doing all sorts of really interesting questions or queries, right? So I'm showing you here the first version um, of, of the software that we created. Where we are at the moment, both are in beta, but we are at the moment in version two. So this is the version, uh, the first version of the GTA software. And what you see here is um, the corpus window that allows you to read the actual historical document. So through this window, you can scroll down and read all the texts that are within uh, your corpora, but you can also jump between uh, the different bits of uh, corpora that you have. So to the left, you have an index of the different texts that uh, your collection is composed 
off, and then uh, to the right, you have a map that displays all the toponyms that are mentioned within the corpus that you upload. Now, in the lower uh, right, uh, you have what is called the Keyword in Context tool that allows you to see the queries, the result of the query. So it puts in the middle uh, the term that you are looking for, and it gives you its context to the left and to the right. Um, and so you can ask for 30 words to the left, 30 words to the right, or 300 to the left and 300 to the right, whatever you want, right? And so there is also a window with metadata, um, information on the annotations, and finally, uh, you have also different tools to query the collection. And so all these windows are connected in such a way that if you click, for instance, um, on a word or a label or a string, if you want, of different set of words in the corpus, um, uh, this, is, um, this is updated and it executes the query in a way that retrieves all the information related to that particular uh, concept. But this is also connected to the geographic information. Um, so this is in such a way that if a particular piece of information is associated to its context, um, to a geography, it will show you also that. So you can also um, carry out geographic queries. Uh, so this is to say that if you want to know what is being said about a particular set of uh, geographies, you can actually ask through the map uh, interface as well. So, if I wanted to investigate, for instance, the potential social network of all the people that is mentioned in the collection from this information, I can ask the software to show me all the people that appears in this collection and the geographies that are associated to them. And with this kind of analysis then, for instance, I could study the composition um, of governmental structure and constitution at the time if you wanted. And this is uh, the version two of the software, by the way. And in the same way as previously um, in the other example, what we see in the screen is identifying all those sentences that um, uh, talk about illness in the section of the corpus that corresponds to a bit of the relaciones. So this is just a part of the ecclesiastical uh, jurisdiction of the Arzobispado de Mexico. And in this particular case, it also shows you which geographies are related to these mentions. Now, I'm showing the relaciones as an example, right? But in addition to this, um, um, this kind of technique allows you cross-referencing information, for example, from, again, thousands of books or documents, where if you wanted to search for the mention of a particular disease, not only in the relaciones, but also in Sagún, Hernández, Codice Badiano, or you bring any uh, collection of historical sources, um, also in indigenous languages, if you wish, um, this can be done. And we can then export this to other formats, such as Excel um, spreadsheets, so we can carry out further advanced spatial analysis in, um, in other software like uh, geographic information systems, R, and so on, right? So what you basically see in the table in here is in the first column is um, um, the reference to all the different documents from which the information is coming from. You have metadata, um, so it gives you an index that it connects where the actual keyword in context is coming from, so you can exchange between your results and go back to the corpus to read you know, more extensively if you want. So it's an interplay between what we call close reading and distant reading. Um, you have then the context to the left, the right, and then also uh, the place name that uh, that bit of information is connected to, and then finally you have the latitude and longitude of these places um, and the bibliographic reference from which you can find these place names as well. So if you wanted with this spreadsheet, you could actually bring these to things like Google Earth or Google Maps, um, and you can map the mentions um, of this particular, uh, in this case, diseases, right? So what this in effect means is that we have now a very powerful way not only to identify relevant information across thousands of records, but also to map and investigate the geographies associated to any topic of my interest. And in this particular case, what it's allowing me to do is to map for the very first time and at a scale that was impossible before, the mention of many different diseases across the visa royalty. And so I will be here until August um, and I'm doing in this uh, analysis, but I can anticipate already that um, we are finding really interesting things that um, I don't feel yet uh, 
prepared to share, um, but that I will say have the potential to shift at least some of the general discourses that have been traditionally managed um, in the study um, of epidemics. Okay, so my fellowship at CAPAS has been very exciting because it's allowing me to truly start um, reaping the benefits of many years of development of these data sets, um, methodologies, and software, right? And of course, um, our interaction, I will say, with so many interesting and quite brilliant scholars as well, is enabling me to formulate things in terms that I haven't thought about before. So in the next few months, I'll be wrestling with uh, these data and questions. So just to finish, I want to come back to my simple initial questions. How can we understand or define the beginning or the end of a world? And I think the answer in this case is it's complicated. Um, because on one hand, it doesn't end. The Mesoamerican world is transformed profoundly, but many aspects do not end, at least not immediately or in the way that is popularly portrayed in documentaries about the disappearing of the Mayan, right? That is, <laughs> the Mayan never disappeared, they are very much there. Um, the same as the Nahua, we are very much still here. And even in areas of substantial change, such as religion, where of course there is a significant shift from polytheism to monotheism, things are not simple or as simple as might uh, first appear. Christianity was not introduced in a uniform way in what we call now Latin America. By the end of the 16th century, there were still places that have heard of the Spanish, but they have never seen one, right? And we have also to remember that it is a member that is away from the eighth and the center. This is to say 1697, that the last the last man, the 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 and in this sense, to understand the complexities of these stories, we need to explore the histories beyond the main centers of power and the best uh, documented episodes. But certainly in memory, in their remembrance, it is narrated in the books of Chilam Balam, a perceived better world where there was once order, it is in fact lost. And this is the experience also of uh, uh, central Mexico. In the Libro de los Coloquios that Sagún collects, 12 Franciscan friars have an enormously significant conversation with several indigenous Tlamantinimes, um, or wise people that um, are in charge to keep the wisdom of the communities. And in one of the chapters, the Nahua priests say, we are the Masehuales, we are perishable, we are mortal. May we not die, may we not perish, although our gods have died. And Gonzalo Sanchez de Tagle has pointed to two elements of huge significance in this passage, and I think he has done that in such an elegant way that I'm not going to be, you know, do justice here. But um, on one hand, Masehual means the deserving, and he says that this points to the principle of reciprocity with the creator gods of the fifth son, who died in sacrifice to create life in motion and start the era um, in which we are living now that is called the fifth son. So one has to remember that Mesoamerican people, um, uh, uh, for Mesoamerican people, time was cyclical. And with the creation of this new son, the era of people as we know it begins. And then the Spanish, and most importantly, Christianity arrives. And when they allude to the death of the gods, this represents much more than their eschatological or real demise. But they are referring to the cultural extinction that opens the door to the death of cyclical time, because with the introduction of Christianity will mean the uh, victory of linear time. And in my own reading of the passage, what I see in the words, we are perishable, we are mortal, we may not die, may we not die, may we not perish. What we see is precisely the inevitable realization that cultural extinction is crouching at the door, but that they, as Masehuales, as the deserving, will continue. And this in, is the same in other areas. 
On one hand, there is the lived experience of diseases that they have never seen before. And on the other, the same as the death of the gods is described in the colloquios, the introduction of a new system of understanding illnesses, the body as well, will substantially transform medical practices and ideas. And in this sense, indigenous societies go through cultural extinction and therefore certainly the end of the world. But many practices actually persist. In Latin America, we have a wonderful medical diversity. In Mexico, we have more than 3,000 plants officially cataloged by the government as, uh, that are used in medical practices. And in this sense, the words of the Tlamantimines, may we not die, may we not perish, although our gods have died, serve in my view more than as a wish, as a fulfilling prophecy where Mesoamerican people will continue, doesn't matter how many ends we encounter. Thank you. <laughs>